Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today's video is all about pseudolingo and terminology, so you know what's going on when your tailor, your alterations tailor, or someone else talks to you about suits. The suit is one of the most complex garments in classic menswear because a lot of things go into it and it's defined by a lot of details as well as the fit. Each detail of the suit influences another and so it's important to understand what it is and how it can affect your overall look. We'll cover all the basic terms as well as some advanced ones. Actually, there's so much to this video that we had to split up into two parts. So first of all, what is a suit? The term suit comes from the French word suivre, which means to follow. Because of that, a suit is defined as being a matching jacket and trousers, pants, or slacks. This means same color, same weave, same pattern. So it is not a suit. For example, a combination of a jacket with odd trousers or slacks, or a jacket that doesn't have quite the same fabric, even though the color might be the same. If you have a three-piece suit with a waistcoat, that's still considered to be a suit. If you exchange the vest for something contrasting, such as a white vest with a brown suit, it's still called a suit because it has the two pieces of jacket and pants. Okay, first, let's look at the overall suit silhouette or style. On the one hand, you have single-breasted suits, and then you have double-breasted suits. Single-breasted means you have a single row of vertical closing buttons, versus double-breasted means you have two rows of closing buttons. For this categorization, it doesn't matter how many buttons you have. It can reach from one button over two to three buttons, but also four buttons or five buttons if you have things like a Nehru jacket. A single-breasted suit does not have any fabric overlap in the front, which is a reason those suits are better for hot summer weather, whereas a double-breasted suit has an overlap of fabric in the front and is typically a little more formal, and it's better in the winter because the extra fabric keeps you warm. Next up are the lapels. These are those pieces of fabric here that have quite an important influence on the overall look of your garment. Because it's folded back, the French term revers, which is also used in German or in Italian, is really accurate in describing that you see the reverse side of the fabric. Lapels are always connected to the collar in your back. Typically, the two most common lapel sizes you can see are either a notched lapel or a peak lapel, which always features this peak. Apart from that, you can also have the Mao collar or the so-called touts lapel, which is kind of a mix of a notch lapel and a peak lapel. Notch lapels are defined by the straight seam of collar and lapel. Also, unlike a peak lapel, you don't see any peak or point. A variation of that comes with an angled line, which is also known as the Kniche River after the Viennese tailor Kniche. Traditionally, notch lapels only appear on single-breasted suits. There was a period in the 80s and 90s where you could see double-breasted jackets with notch lapels, but in terms of classic men's style clothing, that is a faux pas. Overall, most men initially feel more comfortable with a notch lapel because it is less formal and is probably the predominant way to cut a lapel in this day and age. Peak lapels, on the other hand, always have that little peak so the line goes up, and to me, it's always indicative of a arrow direction. If the arrow goes up, we have a peak lapel. If the line comes down and you have a horizontal line and there's no peak up, we're talking about a touts lapel named after the Savile Row House E touts. Unlike notch lapels, peak lapels can appear on single-breasted as well as double-breasted jackets, and they're overall always a bit more formal than the notched ones. Because of that, they're often featured on power suits, and you also see them a lot with morning wear as well as evening wear. The little point in Italian is sometimes called punta, which means point. Apart from that, there's lapel style, typically reserved for evening wear, which is called the shawl collar, which combines the lapel and the collar in one element. For evening wear, I would always go with either a shawl collar or peak lapels 
for everyday suits. I have notched as well as peak lapels in my collection and the more casual suits always get a notched lapel. So you never see me having a tweed suit with peak lapels because it would just be uncharacteristic of the fabric. Now, once you're a little more advanced, you hear people talk about the gorge. It's G-O-R-G-E. And it refers to the seam between the collar and the lapel. Stylistically, its position has varied over the years. If you look at suits from the 30s, the gorge sits much lower and it's more dropped at an angle. If you look at more modern suits or contemporary suits, oftentimes the gorge is very high to the point where peak lapels sometimes have the point that is above the shoulder level, which in my opinion is too high. Ultimately, there is no right or wrong and it depends on the current fashion as well as your personal taste. The only way to influence your gorge is when you have a suit custom made or bespoke made because it's not something you can alter after the fact. However, if you can change it, it really has a huge impact on the overall look. Having your gorge lower will make your suit look more vintage, making it higher, more contemporary, and a little more aggressive. For my personal taste, most current standards gorges are a little too high. I prefer them a little lower without going too low because that way I get a suit that is very classic and timeless. Also, if you're shorter, having the gorge raise a little bit can give the visual appearance of height, which might be advantageous. If you look at jackets from Atolini in Italy, they're all very high. Having a higher gorge in combination with a wider lapel can also give the impression of a bigger chest, which might be advantageous. Which brings us to the next point, which is the lapel width. Again, it has a huge impact on how others perceive your suit even though it's the same in terms of comfort. Skinny lapels are typically between two and two and a half inches or five to six centimeters. Wide lapels are anything that are above four inches or 10 centimeters. A sweet spot for many is about three and a half inches or eight to nine centimeters. Just like with other elements of the suit, the lapel width and tastes have changed over time. Going back in the 30s, you see the low gorge with a very wide lapel. By the way, when I talk of lapel width, it's always measured at a 90 degree angle right at the point of the lapel. Just like with anything in classic men's clothing, extremes can make you look very dated very quickly versus a moderate lapel width will always stand the test of time and will never stand out as being too fashionable or too old fashioned. In recent years, slim lapels have become a lot more popular in combination with a higher gorge. At the same time, if you go to PT Uomo in Florence, you see a lot of wider lapels as kind of an anti-movement to the mass market slim lapel suit jacket. After all, having very wide lapels is a very clear statement that you have something at custom made for you. While some people prefer to have a constant lapel within their wardrobe, especially if they do custom suits, Personally, I'm a big fan of having slightly different repels that are neither too extreme, so they all fit within a certain roster. For me, that is anything between seven centimeters, just under three inches, and about four and a half inches, which is about 11 centimeters. As a general rule of thumb, three and a half inch width lapels paired with a three and a half inch wide necktie works very well for 90% of men out there. If you want to deviate from that gold standard, keep in mind that getting wider lapels will help make your chest look more impressive, but at the same time, it will visually slim down your shoulders. At the same time, a narrow lapel can make your chest look slimmer and your shoulders look broader. If you're a short man or a very slim man, I suggest to go with slightly slimmer lapels because it will look more proportional on you. On the other hand, big and tall men will look better with slightly wider lapels, because everything looks harmonious that way. If you're a big man and you wear a suit jacket with very slim lapels, it makes you look just as goofy as the little short five foot three guy with four and a half inch lapels. Another aspect of the lapel is a so-called lapel belly. Basically, what it describes is the rounding of the lapel or the lack thereof. If you look at German suits or British suits, 
oftentimes the lapels are cut pretty straight. In the 30s sometimes, they had an extreme rounding to the cloth, which you could see if you take a closer look. In terms of tailoring, there are two schools of thought. Some tailors really dress the fabric heavily with their iron, so stripes on the fabric curve along the edge of the lapel. Personally, I find it to look much more pleasing to the eye. In Italy, oftentimes, if you look at striped suits with a belly, the stripes simply are cut off, which is a stylistic choice, but just not one that I would personally make. Having a more convex curve on your lapel belly can make it look a little more casual. Having it straight can be a little more formal. The belly curve is usually most visible on a three roll two jacket, which means you have a three button jacket that is only buttoned on the middle one, and therefore you get a better roll, or you can also really see it in double-breasted jackets. Personally, I like to have a slight belly, and if there's stripes or a pattern, I want them to really follow along that edge. Apart from the lapel belly, something that's really desirable in suit jackets is a so-called lapel roll. What I mean by that is the area just above the closing buttons and how they roll. If you have a cheaper suit jacket, typically they're ironed very flat, which makes a suit look very flat and not very three-dimensional. On the other hand, if you have a sewn canvas, you automatically always get a certain amount of roll. You can always enhance the roll by ironing on the inside of the lapel. And to learn more about ironing a suit jacket in a detail step-by-step, step, please check out this ironing video here. By the way, if you wanna learn the differences between suit canvases and constructions, please check out this video guide here. A good lapel roll with a decent amount of a hollow area that curves really nicely is typically associated with higher-end handmade garments that have a floating canvas. Personally, I love the lapel roll and I can't get enough of it, so I wanted it in all of my jackets. Honestly, I've never seen a bespoke suit wearer asking for flat breast lapels. Honestly, that's a hallmark of a $100 suit that's just coming back from a cheap dry cleaner. Next, let's talk about suit buttons, and specifically the buttoning point and the buttoning stance. Typically, the suit lapel roll ends where you button the jacket. In certain cases, that is not the case, such as in a three roll two jacket or sometimes with single button jackets. Also, the number of buttons you have in your jacket will impact the size and the shape of the lapel. If you have a four button jacket, the lapel will be quite small, even if you decide to go with a very wide lapel, because there's simply not much distance it can cover. On the other hand, if you have a jacket with a single button, the lapel will look larger, even though it may not be as wide on top. As a golden rule of thumb, the buttoning point should always be along your natural waist. It could be about an inch up, or an inch down, but typically for most men, that's a sweet spot. Now, that being said, moving the buttoning point slightly up more or slightly down below can help balance your body. For example, I have a very long torso and relatively short legs. Because of that, I like buttoning points that are slightly above my natural waist, thus balancing my upper body and my legs gives me the appearance of having longer legs and a shorter torso. The same is true for the opposite. If you have very long legs and a short torso, move your buttoning point slightly lower. Again, this is something you can only do in a custom garment because once the buttonholes have been cut in your jacket, you cannot move the buttoning point. If you're very tall, having three buttons is probably better than having two or one button because it makes everything look more proportional in terms of height and balance. Those who carry more weight might prefer a lower buttoning point. And if you're not sure about what to choose, there is no right or wrong answer. Simply be aware of the effect it has on your overall look. For example, going with three buttons rather than two means that you see less of the V shirt front and the less of your tie. If that's a look you like, that's good. If not, then go with a lower buttoning point. For evening outfits. Typically, you want to expose more of the shirt front and the bow tie. And because of that, a tuxedo typically is just a one button jacket. Or it can be double breasted, but the buttoning point is always low. To learn more about 
dinner jackets, smoking jackets, or black tie and white tie outfits, please check out our respective guides on the website. Now, the button stance refers to the distance between the buttons. It's not a detail that many men pay attention to, but it can have a profound impact. Spacing your buttons too closely together just looks weird and off, whereas spacing it too far apart can make it look odd as well. If you're a larger person, having them space a little more apart is more advantageous because again, it keeps everything in proportion. When it comes to double-breasted suits, the button stance has an even more profound impact, especially in terms of the distance between the two vertical lines. You slim it down just like Prince Charles does it, the jacket looks very, very different than if you space them out. In the 30s sometimes, you had really wide buttoning stances with a huge overlap that not only kept you warmer, but it just created an entirely different look. Again, avoiding the extremes will help you to have a garment that is rather timeless. However, if you know what you're doing and you wanna achieve a slimming effect, reduce the button stance on your DB coat. And if you want a 30 style suit jacket, increase the distance. If you wanna learn more about how to button the suit jackets, what mistakes to avoid, and all the options you have, I suggest you check out our in-depth guide here. Sometimes you'll hear the term kissing buttons and all that refers to the buttons on your sleeve and whether they touch and overlap each other or not. Sometimes people say it's a quality hallmark, but personally I've seen many excellent bespoke garments that didn't feature it. So it's really nothing that cries quality or says good or bad. It's simply a personal preference. In terms of distances, you can find anything from overlapping buttons or buttons that are spaced very far apart where there is even enough space to put another button in there if you choose to do so. Surgeon's cuffs are functional sleeve buttonholes, which used to be a hallmark of a custom or bespoke made garment, but today even H&M has them in their lineup, so they've lost some of their luster. A handmade suit will likely always have handmade buttonholes that you can button. A suit from H&M will have machine-made buttonholes and you can still distinguish it that way. But just the fact that you can undo your sleeve cuff buttons is not a quality hallmark anymore. In general, quality buttonholes are always cut first and then sewn. Usually there is always a gimp added, which is something like a thicker, stiffer thread that the buttonhole is sewn around. It gives the buttonhole a raised effect, which is particularly noticeable in what is called as the Milanese buttonhole. It's called that way because tailors in Milan would use that feature to, to differentiate their buttonholes. Today, it's something you can find in any kind of bespoke garment from Australia over South Korea to the US. It's also very delicate, so typically you'll only see it sewn on the lapel buttonholes, not on the actual working buttonholes on the rest of your suit jacket. To this day, fine handmade buttonholes are a hallmark of quality suits, and oftentimes you can see that they're handmade on the back side of the buttonhole because there's irregular stitching. Sometimes you can also sew them both ways, so they look neat in both ways, but that's really hard to find and it's just a nice thing to see a handmade buttonhole because it can't be quite replicated by machines just yet, even though there are excellent buttonhole machines out there these days. And sometimes it's very hard to discern from the front side if something is handmade or not, if the machine used was excellent. If you're talking about less expensive suits that are made in Far East and Asia, chances are those buttonholes look very cheap and it's very easy to discern if it's a quality suit or not just by looking at the buttonhole. All right, that's it with part one. Stay tuned for part two. And in the meantime, if you wanna learn more about suits, how it should fit, all the details and what you can do with them, please check out our other suit videos. I'm certain you will enjoy them. In today's video, I'm wearing a three-piece suit that was custom-made for me. It has medium wide lapels. It is a one-button jacket. Because of that, the lapels didn't need to be that wide. It's a three-piece suit with a matching vest, which is double-breasted. And because of that, I wore the jacket usually unbuttoned. I'm combining it with a white dress shirt with French cuffs and cufflinks in silver and lapis lazuli 
from Fort Belvedere. They work well with a Fort Belvedere necktie, which is made of an English matter silk. The pocket square is a white linen pocket square. It's very formal and goes well with my three-piece suit. The fabric has a slight orange stripe, which is picked up in the socks, which are shadow striped from Fort Belvedere in orange and charcoal. They provide enough contrast with the shoes and pick it up, so it's a harmonious outfit. I opted for single monk straps with a wingtip from Crockett and Jones. On the lapel, I have a Milneys buttonhole, which is hard to see though, because I'm wearing a boutonniere from Fort Belvedere. On my ring, I'm having a lapis ring in sterling silver, which matches the cufflinks. All of the Fort Belvedere accessories can be found in our shop. And if you enjoy our videos and you want to support our content efforts, the best way to do so is to buy something from the shop.